Good morning. It's Monday, the eighth of April, and this is Govind Raj Ethi Raj broadcasting from now a much warmer Mumbai, India's financial capital. Our top stories and themes for the day: the stock markets face macro headwinds in another holiday-shortened week. Oil is holding above ninety-one dollars a barrel, and that's not so good news. Why India struggles with food inflation? Understanding the tools and responses. Tata companies claimed records in steel production to air conditioners. How Indonesia's supply of MacBook Pros and Michelin tires are running out after attempts to impose import restrictions backfires. This is a core report with Govind Raj Athiraj. Macro headwinds in a holiday shortened week. It's another holiday shortened week with markets closed on Thursday this week for Eid. The markets have been strong in general as investors have looked for new themes, including focusing on stocks benefiting from what promises to be a searing summer. More on that later as well. The earnings season also kicks off this week, but macroeconomic trends are likely to weigh on market sentiment, including, of course, oil prices, which are now ruling around ninety-one dollars a barrel, beyond the computations of many economists. And when I say computations, I mean those of India's economic growth, and more on that later too. TCS will kick off results on April twelfth or Friday, so at the end of the week, we should also be seeing inflation data and industrial production data on that same day. So the week itself could go by with more of anticipation than action, unless something else happens. Last week, the markets hit an all-time high, being the Sensex hitting seventy-four thousand five hundred and one on April fourth. During the week, it was up around five hundred and ninety-seven points. On Friday, it closed up twenty points at seventy-four thousand two hundred and forty-eight, and the Nifty was broadly steady and unchanged at twenty-two thousand five hundred and thirteen. Now the mid cap and small cap indices not surprisingly which is given the recent resurgence there was strong. Now there are other external interest rate triggers like the European Central Bank meetings but nothing is going to change for at least a few months and that's quite evident whether in the west or in India. Meanwhile foreign portfolio investors have turned cautious as they pulled out a net of 325 crore rupees from Indian equities in the first week of this month thanks to mostly and presumably high valuations and some uncertainty at least from their perspective the net outflow came after investments of about 35000 crore rupees in march and about 1539 crores in february according to data with depositories quoted by pti now there is some switching also happening to china as we've been reporting here though that may not be the reason for the falling investments interest rates and food inflation Speaking of interest rates, the Reserve Bank of India on Friday maintained a status quo on rates for the seventh consecutive time and said it remains watchful of the developing geopolitical situation that may trigger a further rise in crude oil prices. Stay tuned to get a sense on how that could impact inflation. Now, after sustained moderation, cost push pressures faced by firms are showing upward bias, said the Reserve Bank, and there are of course rising geopolitical tensions including in the middle east and between russia and ukraine which is particularly affecting oil production in an interesting and somewhat complex analogy involving elephants and forests the reserve bank of india governor said 2 years ago around this time when consumer price inflation or cpi had peaked at 7.8% in april 2022 the elephant in the room was inflation now he said the elephant had gone out for a walk and appears to be returning to the forest We would like the elephant to return to the forest and remain there on a durable basis the governor shaktikanta das said so what he means is that he would like inflation that's the elephant to return to a desirable level which is the forest now that's at least how i am interpreting it but then if i got it wrong then full credit to the governor because their kra is to confuse people as at least one governor proudly told me so in an interview some years ago Anyway, to make sense of what's going on, I reached out to Crystal Chief Economist DK Joshi for a status check on the overall inflation environment and also to ask about the link between interest rates and vegetable prices and inflation. I began by asking him what he took away from the Reserve Bank of India's credit policy before moving on to the macro questions. Well, I think number one takeaway was that central banks whether in India or abroad, they are not in a hurry to declare victory over inflation as yet. I mean, 
uh, though the reasons for inflation could be different. I think in India, it's largely or rather solely food inflation, which is which is a worry. Non-food inflation in February was only 2.9%. I mean, so clearly, even food inflation shock is being very closely monitored because growth in the economy is strong. And I think the central bank made a very interesting statement that because growth is strong, it is providing them space for inflation control. What this means is that they will not be in a hurry to cut rates unless the supply shock subsides. And then let's come to food inflation and within food, I guess, vegetables, which is causing most of the trauma. Now, tell us about how this works and why is it that, one, we are not able to bring it down or control it, and two, should we be even looking at credit policy or interest rates as a tool? Well, I think uh, typically you're right that the monetary policy, in a way, cannot bring down food inflation because uh, it's a supply shock. And it has to be addressed through supply side measures. But what happens is if the supply shock is persistent, which I think in case of India, it has been food inflation has stayed high for quite some time now. And if the economy is also strong at the same time, then the food price shock can travel to the other parts of the inflation. I think that is what the central bank is trying to do. It is trying to keep inflation expectations anchored by keeping the monetary stance hawkish. And it has also tried to prevent the transmission of food inflation to the other parts or possible transmission of food inflation to the other parts So by being cautious on the rate front. So that is one. I think now coming to your uh, vegetable inflation, actually both food grain and vegetable inflation have been an issue this year. Food grain inflation has come down to a little below 10%, but it is still quite high. I mean, it is still needs to be brought down. But the vegetables are creating major issue. Uh, central banks typically would look through vegetable inflation because it has very short cycles, unlike the food grain inflation, where the cycles are longer. And it also goes up and comes down. But I think this time, uh, we have seen that the vegetable inflation also has been persistent. In the month of February, it was 30.2%, which is quite high. So what happens in vegetables is that demand typically remains strong and is in some ways inelastic also. So the supply shocks very quickly translate into very, very high prices for a number of vegetables. And we've seen vegetable prices spike very sharply and also come down. So there is something which the economists call a cobweb phenomena. So what happens is that when the prices are high, the, the farmer sows more and uh, you get an oversupply and the prices drop. And then when prices drop, he sows less and then, then I think the supply is reduced and the prices keep going up. So that is the natural cycle which happens in vegetables. But when there are weather shocks, whether it could be rain related, it could be heat related, or it could even be a pest attack for that matter. I think then the cycles get accentuated and they, they could last much longer. I mean, and that's what probably is happening in India. And right now, I think our uh, report released by some of my colleagues called RR, the Roti Report, I think that was pointing out that even in the month of March, onion, potato and tomato prices have remained uh, remained high and actually there have been lower arrivals of, uh, of crops. So clearly we need to, it's weather, it is the behavior, it is the uncertainty of prices in vegetables which causes these ups and downs. It's also, I think, apart from that, also storage issues. I think vegetables are not as storable for longer periods of time as food grains are. And transportation bottlenecks and I think post-harvest losses, all these things are uh, very, very common and more prominent in the case of vegetables. That is why I think we typically see very volatile prices uh, in, in vegetables normally. And this accentuates when the weather-related problems uh, become more prominent. And speaking about weather, uh, you wrote a column which was very interestingly titled, Waiting for Summer. So I'm assuming when you say waiting, it's not in a very good sense. It seems to sound more apprehensive rather than happy. So can you walk us through why? I mean, what it meant was, what it was supposed to mean was that in summer you could see a rate cut. I mean, that's what the title uh, was meaning to say, because we still expect the rate cut at the earliest in the month of June. Now, I think the worry on the inflation front, as I said, is from the most volatile component of prices, which is vegetables, and also, I think, to some extent, the food grains, which are also volatile. Now, this there is an expectation that the monsoons will be normal because the El Nino will be replaced by La Nina, so you'll get ample, ample rains. And if that happens, I think we could see not only normalization of vegetable prices, 
and but also I think a sharp drop, I would say, in cereals prices, I think over a period of time. That is a if because we'll get more clarity on the rains uh, closer to the start of the season. As of now, the first estimates are quite encouraging. If that happens and if the oil prices don't shoot up too much, I think we could see the rate cut happening. I mean, even in June, although I think the risks are not so evenly balanced for our call. I mean, we it could actually get postponed also. But current expectation is yes by June. So. Oil is currently at $91 DK, so which is now almost 20% higher than where we started at the beginning of the year. And obviously, after 23, where thing, it was fairly benign, things are now changing for various reasons. So at this level, and now with all indications suggesting that it might actually go up further, uh, though we don't know how much, what's your outlook? Well, I think when we make a forecast of 6.8% uh, GDP growth, and also 4.5% inflation, we are assuming crude oil Brent at 80 to 85 range, average for the, the current fiscal year, which is 24-25. Now, as you rightly pointed out, I think oil prices have sp seen a spike. The Red Sea area has been a red flag for oil prices for a long time. We do not know how it will behave. I think it is uh, it's very hard to predict, but we all definitely know what the impact of rising crude prices on the economy is. I mean, and it is typically borne by three players. Uh, one is the households, if the oil prices tend to rise, the consumers face higher inflation. It could be oil companies uh, where our profits could come down, or it could even be government where if they are giving subsidies for that. And I think in this menu, I would say that the burden, uh, if oil prices shoot up further and they stay high, under that condition, I think the burden will be borne more by the oil companies and, by, and shared by the government than by the consumers. Now, what happens when oil prices rise is the cost of production for a number of companies goes up. Prices of naphtha go up, which means fertilizer production becomes more expensive. Aviation turbine fuel is always in line, moves in, moves in line with, so to say, global prices. So you can see impact on airlines, etc. It does raise input costs, which can be passed on to the end consumer, particularly if the growth in the economy remains strong. And we also know that uh, the current account deficit, which is low currently, it can go up if oil prices stay high. It also reduces GDP growth, high oil prices. I think these are, I think people have estimated the exact parameters, but I would say directionally, I think one should talk because the it's not so easy to get the full impact of the shock. It's one key variable to be monitored for India, largely because we import a lot of oil. And I think that makes us more vulnerable also. You know, we all watch the U.S. Federal Reserve to see what they do. Now, you two have pointed out that while what they do is not necessarily incumbent on what we do, but nevertheless, there is a link. So tell us a little bit about whether this links and how it links, which is the U.S. Federal Reserve cutting rates and whether we will be in sync or could be in sync. I would say that our monetary policy decisions are mostly based on domestic conditions of inflation. Now we live in an interconnected world. So I think there will be some spillover of what happens in the systemically important central banks like the US Fed. It need not be one to one. I mean, just to give you an example, in this rate hike cycle, we have raised rates by only 250 basis points, whereas the Federal Reserve raised by 525 basis points, I think, uh, which is quite unusual. I mean, uh, and also I think so. Because of the interconnectedness, the central banks do look at, in emerging markets, do look at what the, what the systemically important central banks are doing. Currently, I think S&P, which is our parent company, expects US Fed and ECB to start cutting rates uh, by June. The emerging market central banks, particularly in Latin America, I think they have already started cutting rates and they'll probably continue with the same. And Asian central banks are expected to cut rates sometimes in the middle of this year. So we do see a rate cut possibility by June this year if oil doesn't play a spoil sport. I think oil is the key monitorable right now. From the U.S. Fed perspective, as I said, I think if, if the U.S. Uh, Fed uh, interest rate declines or decreases or cuts that we are expecting, uh, they get delayed. I think that could have some impact uh, on us, particularly if, if oil prices shoot up and it raises our external vulnerability. DK, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Oil prices are now rising above 
Brent crude prices have now increased close to 20% to hit the $91 mark thanks to geopolitical risk and supply tightening. Analysts are saying oil prices began to rise after the International Energy Agency on March 14th increased its demand forecast and reduced its supply forecast. The business standard says a $10 per barrel increase in oil prices leads to a 40 to 60 basis point increase in consumer price inflation in India, which, as we know, imports nearly 80% of its annual crude oil needs. Bloomberg is reporting that oil is now holding above the $90 a barrel threshold thanks to what it calls a dramatic repricing of geopolitical risk. Fears of a wider region conflict in the Middle East are also rising. Global Benchmark Brent and US Benchmark West Texas Intermediate have both posted their sixth straight sessions of gains. Tata companies claim records in steel and air conditioner production. Meanwhile, some corporate news. Tata companies are reporting record production and sales of various products. Now, this might be the case with other companies in other groups as well, but these are the numbers we have for now. Tata Steel India has said it recorded its highest annual crude steel production at about 21 million tons. That's up 4% on year. Tata Steel production is in general spread across India, the Netherlands and the United Kingdom. And the Netherlands and the United Kingdom produced about 8 million tons of steel. Refrigeration company Voltas, also part of the Tata Group, said it sold over 2 million air conditioners in 2324, claiming that these were the highest ever sales of air conditioners by any brand in a financial year in India. Now, that figure could obviously rise this year, thanks more to heat waves and hot days. Voltas said that sales were up about 72% in the March quarter, that's the quarter that ended now, and up 35% for the whole of last financial year, that's 2324 over the previous year. Among other corporate news, the Adani Group has reiterated its earlier announced target of expanding its solar energy and wind power capacity in Gujarat's Kutch region to 30 gigawatts from around 2 gigawatt currently, apart from 6 to 7 gigawatt of similar projects elsewhere. Adani has said it will invest about 230,000 crores or 2.3 trillion rupees in these projects. Indonesia's supply of MacBook Pros are running out. Lessons thereof. In August last year, India announced a licensing regime for imports of laptops and tablets. This was obviously targeted at the big brands, including Apple and Samsung and others. But the larger objective was to force foreign laptop companies or electronics companies to manufacture or source locally. Now, the government subsequently walked back so many times that if the policy was a person, he or she would have tripped several times over. So Indonesia attempted something similar and is backfiring too. Companies are warning that supplies of products including Apple's MacBook Pro could start to run out as soon as the end of this month, that's April, Bloomberg is reporting. Other goods including Michelin tyres and chemicals shipped from Europe may run out over the next few months because of the rule enforced from March that's seen as an attempt to curb imports of thousands of products. So the rationale behind Indonesia's move is similar to India, which is to make global companies set up production companies onshore. So far, so good. But Bloomberg says that this has instead pushed them to consider scaling back or even cancelling plans to expand operations in India. Now, India is obviously a larger market, but the pushback has been pretty strong too. Also, because the policy pronouncements, like in the one in August last year, came out of the blue. Bloomberg says the import hurdles have ignited furore amongst top executives at companies from Apple to Michelin and spurred business chambers from the US to South Korea to write letters to Indonesia's president asking them to review the matter. This complex rules effectively restrict imports in about 4,000 products, including finished goods, like we mentioned, as laptops and raw materials like hazardous chemicals. To get import permits, companies must now get a letter of recommendation from the Ministry of Industry, but the process is onerous, requiring firms to submit tenancy agreements and annual forecasts of items they intend to bring into the country, according to Bloomberg. Sound familiar, all of this? Well... Where will real estate go in 2024? Prices of everything is of course going up. Stocks, gold, real estate, even cocoa. Data for the first quarter of this calendar year or the last quarter of the last financial year, 2324, continues to support this proposition in the context of real estate. Mumbai and Pune now account for about half of sales in the top seven cities in India. This is broadly or has been the trend in the past as well, but it's good to know. 
And if you knew, by the way, then perhaps you would have bought in Hyderabad, where real estate continues to fly off the shelves and prices continue to rise. So what is broadly the outlook ahead for real estate for the coming few months from an institutional perspective, that is the real estate industry, particularly if you're looking to invest. And then, of course, if you're a buyer of real estate and within that, which segments are looking stronger than the others? I reached out to Vivek Rati, Director of Research of real estate consulting firm Knight Frank, and I began by asking him about the underlying trends that he was seeing in the real estate market right now. Real estate, globally, it's seen strong trends until, say, December 2023 and even in you know, financial year 2024. Particularly in India, if we see all the segments, starting from residential, which is talk of the town, to commercial, office, warehousing, retail, all have participated. Housing, particularly in the last three years, wherein the pandemic served as an inflection point when the home buying sentiment completely changed. And that has been the primary factor which turned the cycle. And despite all of the headwinds that the market has been served over the last year and a half, two years, in terms of increased property price or higher interest rates, it continues. So will it continue? There are various factors, favor of the argument or maybe to some in uh, some against it, but largely the trend continues. On the headline level, all looks good. There are nuances in within the segment. And by that, what I mean is not every consumer is affected in the same manner in terms of all of the catalysts that came into the sector. Particularly when we talk about the housing market, the mid and premium segment, which are segments between 50 lakh to 1 crore and then 1 crore and above, which also includes the luxury housing, the 5 crore, we back it and plus. These segments are doing particularly well and notwithstanding any of the challenges that came in. There are multitude of reasons why this is happening, ranging from or the need for bigger and better lifestyles through uh, home accommodation to wealth creation which is happening in India and over the next five years our projections also indicate the fastest growth of ultra wealthy counts in the country and so on and that is the segment which is actually driving the housing market the bottom of the pyramid which is the lower segment 50 lakh and below is where the challenge is not just share but even in absolute volumes it has dwindled and uh, we do expect that for a sustenance of this cycle in a long-term basis there should be some attention of policy attention in that segment so the last quarter for example are we also seeing a variation in different parts of the country now for example let's say mumbai and Pune are growing 24 percent and 15 percent NCR is down. As I can see, in terms of supply, it's down as well as in terms of demand. So are we seeing any variations within the country? And if so, why? So largely, the trend is secular. And by that, what I mean is most markets have grown in the latest quarter in the range of, say, 1% to 15%. And therefore, not witnessing any inflection point or difference in terms of trends where in any market is degrowing. In fact, you know, for Bangalore, we saw about 2% YOY uh, decline in, in this latest quarter, but still we are considering it to be a strong market because all of the other indicators when looked in conjunction with the sales momentum okay, are supporting the hypothesis that the market is really on a strong footing. And when I say the other indicators, I'm implying the confidence of developers to bring in more launches, the price levels which are continuing between 5 to 12 percent yearly rate, and the participation which is largely end user driven, and therefore, great amount of stickiness in terms of commitment that these consumers are making for this purchase decision. So, with all of this, while the intensity of growth is different across different markets, both in terms of residential and office. But the trend is secular. And by intensity, I do mean that Bangalore, NCR, Mumbai are the big pullers driving volumes. 
But in terms of growth, some of the markets like Hyderabad have seen exceptional growth, outperforming all other markets because of a variety of reasons. And you said that many of the buyers are, or dominant numbers are end users, and therefore that's encouraging. But how is the outlook for 24, 25, Vivek, at this point of time, given the way the numbers have been for the last year or so, including the ups and downs? I mean, I think that's really the bottom line question for many people. How are you seeing prices and what could that do to demand? Fundamental factor which gives comfort to industry stakeholders is the robustness of consumer profile, which is end users versus you know speculators or investors. Not to say that there are none, but largely it is end user. And if you look at the ecosystem, not just from the demand side, wherein people who really need a roof over their head, a shelter for themselves, but also from the supply side, if you see uh, developers, largely what you would note is there are terms of sale which really encourage you or want you to stay until position in terms of you know the purchase decision that you made both from terms of you know transfer of the property until position is generally not allowed or encouraged in this cycle or the rera interventions which need a compulsory registration beyond a threshold of about say 10 percent of collection of monies so all of these will ensure that people who buy today stick to at least four to five years in with this purchase decision. If this kind of stickiness is there, it only makes sense if you're participating as an end user and not so much as an investor. Considering the mortgage costs are at least 9% and 9% ensures that that it will not be a quick in and quick out game just to ride the price cycle. And on the other aspect, which is the property price trend also, we've not seen an exceptional price rise generally in the market. It's been between 5 to 12% annualized over the last three years. So with all of this in the background and a supportive demand supply environment wherein supplies are still, you know, aligned with construction timelines, we think the price cycle is continuing to be in the positive territory over the next one year also. Vivek, thank you so much for joining me. Sure, thanks. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopsis or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening. <laughs>